and I was having like a heart attack, you know, and I'm like, I am, if this doesn't work, then I'm just gonna stop. If you're a creative person, if you're a baker, a dancer, a photographer, a screenwriter, an actor, a comedian, a podcaster, and you wanna figure out how to make a living doing what you love, this is the show. This is the show, don't keep your day job. My name is Kathy Heller and I'm a singer songwriter. I make a living doing what I love and I want that for you. This is the show that's gonna help you do that and give you not only inspiration, but some real life strategies. This is gonna help you figure out how to take your creative passion and turn it into a profit. Thanks to Wistia for supporting Don't Keep Your Day Job. Wistia is the video hosting platform with analytics and video marketing tools that power creative communication for more than 300,000 businesses. Start your free account today at wistia.com. I also want to say a huge thank you to Blue Apron. Blue Apron has been one of our sponsors from the beginning. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash dreamjob. You're going to love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals from blueapron.com slash dreamjob. Hi guys, it's Kathy Heller. Welcome back to another episode of Don't Keep Your Day Job. Today, we have Carly Cylinder here. She's a florist. She's not just a florist though. She wrote a book called The Flower Chef, which has been doing really, really well. And not only does she have um, locations in Los Angeles and New York City and also Dallas, she does all kinds of things. She does events. Um, she does really, really cool stuff. We're going to talk about how she's created a multi-six figure business doing what it is that she loves, working with flowers. Before we dive into that, I want to tell you guys something. I feel like one of the biggest through lines with everybody who we've had on the show is the idea of perseverance. People keep talking about that. And I think that something that everyone takes for granted is the idea that, no, it's not going to just be handed to you. It's not like you're going to sit in your room and someone's going to knock on your door and you're just waiting for someone to give you the opportunity. That's not what's going to happen. But rather, you have to go out there and you have to decide that you want this so much that you're going to go and get it. And I feel like when I listened to Bobby Brown last week tell her story about how she would pick up you know the phone and she'd look in the yellow pages and she'd make cold calls and she'd keep calling and then she'd get somebody else's number and she'd call them and she'd show up and she'd get feedback and they wouldn't like something and she'd fix it and she'd go back again and I asked her who was your inspiration she told me about her her papa Sam and how he had come from Russia and he was an immigrant and how he was a hustler and he had to be that way and he didn't even speak the language but he would pick up the phone and he would figure out what it is that he could sell and how he could do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing I think that we all walk around sometimes with these excuses and they actually don't serve us. They keep us stuck. When you feel that you have an excuse because you just don't know the right person and you would do what it is you love, but you don't know the right person to reach out to, or you would do what you love, but you don't have the time or you don't have the resources. It just keeps you stuck. I feel like in life, sometimes we know exactly what we need to do. We just don't do it. And then it actually gives us the harder life when if we did the harder thing, we'd actually have an easier life because we'd be more fulfilled. So I want you to ask yourself, what is the thing that you know you need to get busy doing, but you're just not doing because it scares you or it feels hard? Because typically, if you do this easier stuff and you stay the status quo, you're going to wind up having a more difficult experience because you're not going to be as fulfilled. But if you make the choices that might be a little bit more scary and you do the things that are harder, you're actually going to wind up with a more fulfilling life. So it's really about making those calls. It's really about putting in that hustle. And you'd be so surprised that when you actually start to do that and you stick in it, and that is the trick is you have to stick in it, good things will indeed start to happen. But you have to be willing to love what it is that you do enough and want enough for yourself to have a life that you love waking up to every day that you're willing to do things that make you a little uncomfortable. I know for myself, I used to do a lot of that. I would have to make cold calls and cold emails and I'd have to put myself in positions where I was putting myself out there and I would have to, you know, be humble enough to submit whatever work I had at the time and I would get rejected or I would get feedback and I needed to go work on stuff. But the thing that I knew I had in spades was my commitment. The thing that I knew that would separate me from someone else was wasn't necessarily talent. It was the commitment, the persistence, the ability to stick in it. My husband says, I have the will of a small country. And that is true. When I want to do something, I am going to do it. I'm going to keep figuring out what it is that I need to do. And I will stay in it until that happens. So I want you to ask yourself, what's the thing right now that you've 
really know you need to do. Really quite often, it's just putting yourself out there and making calls and sending emails and working on stuff and wherever you're at, um, looking at who it is that you might possibly be able to reach out to and asking them for feedback. And maybe you call 13 people and then you wait another week and you call another 10 people and you, you send emails until finally you start to get some headway. But things will happen when you decide to take matters into your own hands and you commit. In life, it's not about the hurdles. It's about how you keep going. And the people who win aren't necessarily the people who haven't had the difficult you know, road to hoe. The people who win are the people who, no matter what happens, they just keep getting back up. They just keep going. They keep taking that hill. They just keep moving forward. That's the name of the game. How can we move forward? And the truth is we are so, so blessed. Like I've said so many times, if you're listening to this right now and you have Wi-Fi and running water and you have an inkling of what it is that you love to do and you're listening to this show you've been hearing from so many different people whether they're super super successful like bobby brown who created a billion dollar business or they're making multi six figures you've been hearing from people who have absolutely figured out a way to make a living doing what they love and that truly is freedom i believe that making it in this life is doing what you love being able to do what you love pay your bills doing a job that never feels like work. So I want you to ask yourself, what's the thing that you know you need to get busy doing? And can you tolerate the the uncomfortableness that you're going to feel? You can. And ask yourself, what's the worst thing that happens if you do it? Okay, sure. Maybe you're going to get a rejection. Somebody's not going to email you back. You might have to feel, quote unquote, like a burden and email them another four times over the next three months. Yes, all of that might be uncomfortable. But what's the worst thing that happens? Okay, so the worst thing that happens is you have to tolerate that feeling. But what's the worst thing that happens if you don't do it? What's the worst thing that happens if you don't put yourself out there, if you don't start working on your craft, if you don't reach out and start emailing those people that you know you need to email? The worst thing that happens there is so much bigger. It's so much harder to deal with than the other thing because the worst thing that happens there is you living a life that you feel passes you by, is you living a life that you feel not excited about you living a life where you know that something inside of you is playing small we cannot afford to play small we don't have the luxury of that much time the time is right now whatever time we have right now we have no idea what's been promised us let's use it so that we can just feel excited and inspired and we can inspire people around us because your only competition is you and you're waking up every day you're playing against yourself so let's think about what's that one thing you can do today that you know if you do it, even if it's going to be hard or if it's going to be uncomfortable, you're going to grow. You're going to grow from doing that. And growth is oxygen. So let's grow. Let's do those things that, yes, they might scare us. Yes, they might be hard. But the scary things and the hard things typically are the things that are going to give us the easiest life in the sense that it's the most beautiful, the most inspiring, the most enjoyable life. And that is the life that I want for all of you. Thanks to Wistia for supporting Don't Keep Your Day Job. Wistia is the video hosting platform with analytics and video marketing tools that power creative communication for more than 300,000 businesses. When you host your videos with Wistia, you get detailed analytics to help you understand how your videos are performing. Their flexible video player lets you customize videos to match your brand. Also, you can capture email addresses right within your video. And if you're thinking, but Kathy, I've never even made a video before. Well, Wistia has free resources and a friendly support service team that's available whenever you need it. I've been using it. It's so much fun. It's so easy to do. And there's so many reasons in a business why you need to make videos and you need to create content. So this is really going to be cool. Um, Companies like Cirque du Soleil and Squarespace and Starbucks and HubSpot, they all use Wistia as their video hosting platform. And you should do it too. You can start your free account at wistia.com. And with your free account, you'll get three video uploads, advanced video analytics, and all the features and integrations that were built with businesses in mind. It's easy to get started with Wistia today. Try it for free at wistia.com. Also, thanks to Blue Apron for supporting Don't Keep Your Day Job. So many of our listeners have emailed me and told me that they've tried it and they love it. They're really, really hooked. Um, I've been using it for weeks and weeks and weeks. It is just delicious. It's so much fun. It allows you to make fresh meals. Everything gets sent to you. It's packed on dry ice. Everything is fresh. Nothing is pre-cooked, um, but it's all pre-proportioned. So they're, they're very conscious about waste and you're going to love it. You're going to get all different kinds of recipes. If you haven't done it yet, please do it. When you support our sponsors like this, they see that you're supporting Don't Keep Your Day Job and then they turn around and they support our show. So it really means a lot to us and it gets you some free stuff. It's all delicious. Uh, Recently, they delivered us some fish and some curry. My kids love it. We open it up every week. We don't know exactly what we're going to get. You get a recipe card with pictures and slowly but surely you go through it and you prepare a beautiful meal and it takes out so much of the guesswork. And, you know, as a mom, I'm always looking, what's what am I going to make tonight? The box comes and I know exactly what I'm going to make and everything is super easy and ready to go. So we love it. 
Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash dream job. That's blueapron.com slash dream job. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Okay, so Carly, I'm so excited to have you here because I love finding different people in the world who do all kinds of different crafts and have made a living doing it. So I wanna hear the whole story. Yeah. I know that you have gone on to create a whole world around yourself and you have a location in New York and a location in LA and you have a huge Instagram following and you've written a book. So yeah. I wanna hear the whole story. So <laughs> okay. let's start. let's start at the beginning. Where did this love for flowers begin? When you were a kid, were you, arranging flowers how does this no. start okay. no no it's funny you say that though because so many about like wanting to work in a flower shop or own one because so many people say that to me oh, and right. um a lot of people will take you know like a private lesson for me because they want to be you know start a flower business but i'm yeah. like i think you just want to be around flowers i don't think right, you want the right. business part and like <laughs> go for it i remember i think i you know buying a my mom a carnation or something in like in <laughs> middle school but like that's pretty much it i had moved to la when i was 19 um, I was trying to do a little bit of acting and just like, I grew up in Arizona. And so I was just like, I got to get out of there. So I just moved out here. I didn't really know anyone yeah. and, you know, having fun. And I remember I just, uh, I was looking for a job. So I applied to one on probably through Craigslist and became a sales girl at a place called, let me think here, Empty Base. And, um, it was really fun. I love being around flowers and I would spray all the you know, like the orchids and deal with the customers. And the, the manager at the time was like, take home these two books because you have to at least, you know, learn some of the flower names. Interesting. And I would just go around the shop and put the little signs, you know, like hyacinth, $2 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's how I learned about all the flowers. And, and then this is when you were 19? Uh, 19 or 20. Yeah. Okay. And then I went back to school. I ended up transferring to UCLA and I had moved by the Grove and I was dating a guy that had owned some restaurants and that kind of got me into thinking about business and entrepreneurship just because of his lifestyle. You yeah. know, I was like, this is awesome. Yeah. Um, the freedom. And so I loved food and I was like, I want to work in food. Like I, that's something I would really love. And so at the time I needed, you know, another job and there was a place called Rita Flora, which was on La Brea in like six. Mm -hmm. And it was, I don't know if you remember it, but it was a, a flower shop restaurant, but um, I applied to be a server because I, I don't know, I just like really wanted to be a waitress. Like that just seems so fun. But they were like, <laughs> like I don't know. I was in college. I was like, oh, I'll probably be the guy. Or, you know, dream big, Carly, dream yeah, big, dream yeah. big. And they were, so they looked at my resume. They're like, oh, you worked in flower shop. We're gonna put you in the flowers. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I was just a sales girl there. But I started to make like a bouquet. Um, I remember there's a lot of it's a you know Jewish neighborhood. So on like Shabbat, I, on Fridays, the people come in to get bouquets you know to bring yeah. to, to dinner and yeah. so I got really good at just making like a bouquet like people would come and wait for <laughs> me to make the bouquet and I was like so okay sweet. This, this is fun and then I'm like I really want this I want to own this kind of business like for me being around flowers I thought I would probably hire a designer you know and and having the food aspect like that was such a like ideal dream for me. So that's what I set out to do. And I then went to another flower shop and I was like, I'll work in a nonprofit while I build my business plan. But you still knew you wanted to eventually open your own flower shop. Yes. Well, I wanted it to be kind of like this venue where it's like a flower shop restaurant. And like at night we would have bands and oh my um, kind of like a multi-purpose kind of like yeah. really cool, you know, maybe something you'd see in Austin or something like that. I want to know about that felt sense experience emotionally why did you love flowers enough to think, okay, I want to do this with my life? It's a total 180 from being in an office or a retail store. You're around nature and there is that creative aspect and it's a beautiful thing, you know, yeah, and people, true. I mean, overall people will buy flowers for happy times, but you know, there's sad times too. But I, I just liked it. I just thought like, this is so nice to be around yeah and I think most people I mean that's why most people most people like it you know yeah. it's definitely like a, a full sensory experience you oh know? yeah there's yeah, yeah. You do it with your hands and like who doesn't like getting their hands messy um so I was there and then I would just read the the SBA website the small business administration website and just read everything about that and I met with they have a program called SCORE where you can meet with a business mentor just to try to figure out how I was going to, you know, open something. Yeah. And then at the 
time, it was like 2008, 2009, and I was living in El Segundo, and my roommate at the time, you know, I was telling her, this is what I'm working on. She's like, we're in a recession. Like, you are not opening any store anytime Mm. soon, you know? And I'm like, well, shoot, okay. So she's like, why don't you just start doing flowers out of our house? And this is kind of where I guess it turned because I was like, okay, yeah, that, that sounds good. And so I would just bring home flowers or leftover flowers and start putting together arrangements with no training at all, no experience. But I mean, I I always say I had to have some kind of natural ability or else I wouldn't have a business right now. But I, my dad, he's in the antique business in LA and he had met someone like at a flea market whose daughter was putting on this party. But he was like, uh, I basically got this job off of nothing. Like I didn't have a website or anything. Uh And it was for like three or 400 people. And it was like 10 arrangements, but they were all going to be different. And I was having like a heart attack, you know, and I'm like, I am, if this doesn't work, then I'm just going to stop before I even started. And, um, so I did it all. And I remember, I think I woke up at 3am just out of anxiety and, and did it and it worked out. And then someone at my old job had offered me, you know, you can do my wedding at cost kind of yeah, and yeah. see what it turns out. And so after those two jobs, I was like, okay, I pulled those off somehow. And yeah. I kind of put one foot in front of the other and, um, and started teaching myself how to design. There were some YouTube videos or take out some books. I had enough photos, really, really pretty crappy photos. And my brother, I think he was in college at the time, made me a very basic website and I put it, put it online. So I started out doing those daily orders and then I got into weddings because I think that's probably the easiest thing as a florist, you know, to get into. But I was really unhappy doing that. It's not, it's not very creative in my opinion, you know, I just didn't like it. And I really wanted to do more like events and corporate events, but it was very hard for me to get those jobs just because of a ton of competition. So it's kind of having a breakdown over everything over the business. And I moved to New York in 2013. I was going to give living in New York ago. I was really over my business, you know, completely. And I had a a freelancer to just kind of taking any jobs I got in LA while I was out there. But I had two bi-coastal clients that were PR firms, and those are my favorite kind of clients. And they do, they just put on lots of fun events for editors and, and now bloggers and all that. And so I had called, maybe even sent an email and said, you know, I'm in New York, just saying hi. I didn't really yeah. know anyone. And they're like, oh, are you doing flowers out here? And I'm like, well, what would you have? And so you know, the first job I think they had was for Swarovski for a very cool thing. And I was like, oh, so it was like really these events that I could never get out in LA because how did you, how did you put it together? If you were just, how did you get all the supplies and the people to help you put it together? Originally what happened was uh, in New York, the flower districts, it's, it's small. It's just really like a block. Um, on 28th street. And I was like, Oh, what am I going to do? You know? And I came there and, um, I looked like a little kid cause I looked pretty young and I was just kind of walking up and down the streets. And I went into one of the suppliers, like the va- a vase supplier. I was like, do you rent space here? Like I was thinking maybe someone would rent me space. And they're like, Oh, go into this shop, like go into this place. And I went into this plant nursery place. And I was like, do you guys rent space? Like, no, so-and-so take her to Pedro. And I was like, what? And so I followed this guy. <laughs> this is like a movie. It totally was because I was like, what is going on? And then they brought me to this building and introduced me to Pedro, who's the building manager. And it's a very cool building. There's probably like 50 floors that rent space there on either, you know, per event or per week or per month. Yeah. Yeah. And Pedro's just looking at me like, who are you? You know? And right. I was like, can I rent space? So that's how I kind of found the space. And kind of at that same time, yeah. I was also teaching classes at a place called Brooklyn Brainery in New York. And they have classes on everything. But I would teach the flower classes maybe once a month, like just fun classes, you know, like a make a bouquet in a mason jar, something like that. Fun place. I still do it. And... Um, I would always pick out the best designers there. And the woman that runs it, she's like, you treat this like your Craigslist. Because I'm like, yeah, I just find everyone that way. Because you can see who's just naturally good, you know? And I'd be like, do you want to do flowers? you want to help out? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, just like everything, when you're starting out, you're doing every single job. Of course, I, I'm sure I did those first few jobs all alone. I did the first... I think I did three big weddings by myself, like every single thing. And, and then you can 
get a little bit smarter <laughs> and realize you need help. And then, you know, when you focus on the things you do like, the universe, it, it, it really does bring it to you. And I love doing that, the corporate work. And so my best kind of clients are PR firms because they are always working with different brands. So uh-huh. it was, it's really fun. Like I had one big client in New York we did all the fragrances and cologne launches. So that was really cool because we'd always match the flowers to that fragrance. What was the book about? What did you want? Why were you passionate about contributing this text? Well, the the concept for the book came after the first year I started my company. And the idea really was I wanted to make a book that was like, Rachel Ray, but for flowers. So I just wanted a book that made flowers easy for the average person that wanted to learn some design principles and techniques because I could not find a book out there when I was starting out that first year. Like they all had these really weird diagrams and they, I still to this day do not know scientific terms for names. So much in floral design events, it's just like there's so much pretension, like I wanted to create the book that I really needed, like all of those like tips and tricks, you know, even what's your book called? It's called the flower chef. And I love it. it, It's in the format of a cookbook. So like a recipe book and recipe, a recipe is nothing new to floral design. You know, we all call a recipe for an arrangement, you know, how you put it together, but I wanted it to be very, intuitive to someone and I wanted them to be able to keep it in their kitchen not like on a coffee table Um, I wanted people to use it so that you could go to Trader Joe's or wherever you're going to go pick up like sunflowers hydrangeas and stock or snapdragons whatever you have and make up something so a lot of the recipes in the book use the same say 10 flowers that you would be able to get how did this even happen how did you get a book deal I researched you know how to publish a book and I got a book proposal together that was pretty terrible now that I look back I mean like I think it was like a half page overview and you know it was probably like 20 or 30 pages and had some sample recipes and all that yeah and so I just did a ton of research I tried to meet with people that had written books and try to ask like do you know a literary agent do you know a literary agent which kind of led to nowhere and I was submitting queries you know through email at this point yeah. to different agents. So I think they're, I think it's called agentquery.com. You can kind of look and see who specializes in oh, what. Neat. So there's not a whole lot of agents at good agencies that do lifestyle. And I was like, I want a good agent. So um, I submitted all those and a few asked for a full book proposal. The whole thing too is there was no Pinterest at all. There was not, there's blogs, but like not really. So at the time, um, everyone was saying there's no interest in flowers. There's no market oh, right, right. For, for that. And so I was getting rejected a lot and I kind of, I didn't give up on it, but I don't know how many rejections I got, maybe 50 or hundred. I don't know a lot. And nine months after I had emailed my now literary agent, she wrote back and she said, I was about to have a heart attack when I looked at, you know, checked my email and it just said, hi, Carly, I'm so sorry. I put your email in the wrong folder. I'm very interested oh, in, my what God. You're, in what you're doing. Are you still looking for representation? Nine months after I'd emailed. And I was like, oh my God. And it was like, yes. And I went and then try to revise my book proposal. And we had a call and I remember she said, she like looked at my book proposal. She's like, I'm going to send you some book proposals of books that sold so you can see, you know, <laughs> what, like what it should look like. And I remember looking through and she, they were um, cookbooks, you know, cause that's right, the most that's comparable. The yeah. yeah. We worked on the book proposal together and she, you know, of course has editor friends and I think was trying to see, get a feeling for if it would sell. And everyone said, you need to have a bigger platform. You know, if I could Uh write some articles for Huffington Post, that would make me credible and make me an expert. And I'll write about weddings or, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And so I I asked one of the the people that were writing for Huffington Post, like, oh, is there an editor you think, you know, I could contact or whatever? She was like, you know, I heard Ariana, like Huffington speak. And she said that if you're interested you know, just to email her. I was like, oh my God, that that was good for nothing. Like I could have done that, but I did email Ariana and she must have like a zillion people working for her because they wrote back pretty fast and they're like, okay, send a sample. And so I think I did and I never heard back and I followed up 
at least four times. It was like every two weeks. And I mm-hmm. think the guy got really sick of me and he, he like CC'd the weddings editor and was like, just load her in to have a profile. Like, <laughs> and so, and so that I started doing articles there. How many? I might have like 10 or 15. I started doing a wow, little bit of travel writing on there. Yeah. I mean, now I, I kind of write about what I want to write about, but I was writing about trends or various topics. So I did that. And then there's also a website, I don't know if you know of it, called Help a Reporter Out. I found out about that through Tim Ferriss's book, through the four-hour work week. And I used that kind of as a Bible when I was first getting started because he had such good resources in that wow. book. You know, I started my worst first website on Weebly, which was a recommendation in that book. So Help a Reporter Out, he had listed in there. And it's for journalists looking for sources. So it's like this email that goes out So I got small press off that, you know, like any opportunity I would do that or I was submitting myself to editors just trying to get more press. And then I would try to collaborate with people that were more successful than I was on photo shoots and try to get some editorial coverage that way. So I I was trying to build it up and a couple of years had gone by, honestly. And what happened is I was living... In New York, I went into a Barnes and Noble and I saw a book there and it was called The Flower Recipe Book. And my Mm. book is called The Flower Chef. So Uh it's pretty similar. And I already knew that books took about two years to get, you know, published once they were sold. So I was like, okay, you know, they had gotten that sold a couple years ago. And I was just, I was really about to have a heart attack because I was like, this is, you know, this is what I was have been working on. So I sent to my agent, I was like, I'm so sick of trying to build my platform. Like I, at that point I had done pretty high profile events for celebrities, you know, maybe not publicized, but I had definitely done the work and I felt like I had a big enough portfolio than the, than these other florists that had these books out, you know? So I was like, you need to sell it or else I'm going to find another agent. Like I was just like over it, you know? And so we reworked it and she took it out to the major publishers and it was getting rejected (laughs) pretty much by everyone because now there's this other book. So Uh then, but that book did really well. And so they said, it's a fluke that that book did well instead of realizing that people at this point, because- Oh my God, at every turn you had to stay so committed because people were not, they weren't getting it. No one, got it. It. no one would even take me because they were just rejecting it. They're like, there's already a flower book out or it's a fluke that that one book's doing well. And so I met with Grand Central Publishing, which is owned by Hachette. And, you know, we did the like an hour long meeting and 80 to 90 percent of it, I was very surprised, was all about the marketing. Like, who do you know in New York? Who's going to be your thing? Like, what groups are you associated with? Like, how are you going to publicize it? So... I happen to be really good at marketing. I think that's definitely my strength in business, you know? And so I I did a good job, um, I guess, conveying, you know, how I would do the marketing. And then they ended up giving an offer. But when they bought it, that was 2013. It didn't come out till 2016. So it got delayed like a year and a half. (laughs) I know. Now there's just, there's so much content out there. Um, Oh, yeah. um, and it was a little bit difficult because things were kept popping up and popping up. I'm like, I just want my book out there. While all that, that was going on, you were building your, your business. I was building my business and the book had sold and I just kind of like made that my intention and things started to fall into place. You know, I started getting a lot of more corporate work out there and I wanted to move back to LA just because of the weather and lifestyle. Yeah. Um, but I got so busy that for six months, I was just going back and forth from LA to New York and pretty much couch surfing. And every time I thought I was moving back to LA, I would get a big job in New York. Like um, I got to do flowers for the Super Bowl when it was in Jersey for one of the, you know, the big sponsors of it. Uh-huh. And so wow. that was a really cool job and just things like that. Because what, what was happening also is people in LA, especially these like event producers, they knew I was out there. And so it's a lot easier sometimes for a client to be able to just deal with one person. Like they don't have to look around. So that's what was happening. And then I moved back here and then I go back to New York. It depends. Like this past fall, it was, it was really busy. I, I went back probably like five or six times within two or three months, but normally it's like once a month. Wow. 
So then, yeah, the book came out. It's kind of like everything was happening, you know, everything overlapped. Um, mm -hmm. But I was definitely, definitely working on, like, the book was my biggest passion. And I was like, I'm not leaving New York until I either get a TV show or sell this book. While all that was going on with the book, you were building your business back up. Yeah, I kind of, I started another thing that I like doing is kids parties. I'm working with these really high-end kids party planners, you know, doing whatever, flower crowns or flower arranging for that. And I, I love the business and I love like managing people and I love working with the designer. So I, I was really quite happy just working on the concept and the design and then having other people do the actual arranging. But I think a lot of people, well, they start any business because they love doing the thing and then they don't often like doing the business part, you know? Right. Yes, um, that's true. But you like both. I like both, but I really like the business part. And there's there's a book called The E-Myth. I don't know if you've read it, but it's like the entrepreneurial myth. And that's basically um, what it says. Like, just because you like baking doesn't mean that you'll like running a bakery. What is it about the business that you love? I think I like the freedom. I like the money. I mean, I like working with the clients, you know? Right. Yeah. And I like delivering something that they're happy about. I like being in control, I guess. Yeah. down to it. Well, and... I want to go back to what actually happened once the book came out. Ah, that's like, oh, it's like, so, so that came out last March and I had created my own book tour of sorts. And I went to five cities oh based on people I knew and try to do like either some kind of party or partner with a blogger or, or something, you know, I had a big party out here in LA, but ultimately publishing it depends on so much you know because I was with a really big publisher but they do all these a-list celebrities books so mine kind of fell to the bottom you know mm -hmm. and I was also on my third editor there so yeah. the book kind of it came out and it was very anticlimactic and oh, no. but I think you know they said your book's a little bit different because some books will peak really high and then kind of taper off and yours has been very steady so I just think through some word of mouth and research, it's, it's been very consistent, but I continue to work to promote it. And I've gotten a lot of speaking off that, which is a common thing you hear. You always hear, you don't really make money on the books as much as the opportunity. And yeah. so that has been true for me this year. Like I got to speak at The Knot, which is a wedding website at their conference. Sure, yeah. Cool. And I was at Disney World speaking at their Flower and Garden show, and they flew uh, wow. my boyfriend and I out. And I will be speaking at um, a different type of conference this summer. And actually, I'll be at the, I think it's the Orange County Fair, but they're doing some kind of flower competition. So I get to be like the judge. And um, so just all these other opportunities have come up, and people will email or, you know, tell you how useful it's been. And then it's like, okay, that made. It worth it you know yeah yeah totally so tell us for people who don't know your business what's it like right now how many events do you do you know the details the facts about where it is today so um i think that the way i set up my business has allowed for me to basically make more money than I, uh, maybe other people because i have really really amazing designers that work for me who are so loyal and i think that finding talented people that are very loyal that you trust is mm -hmm. the key because I'm able to have multiple events in both cities and I don't have to be there. Mm -hmm. So like I usually will try to have a lead designer like in New York and LA that can even be the point of contact for larger events mm -hmm. or, you know, do walkthroughs or meet with the client. It's a good way to basically I can make money and be on vacation. I'm still dealing with the clients, making sure it all happens, but right. that's the difference between being an entrepreneur and a freelancer. Like a freelancer, you're, you're doing all the work to make every dollar. And an entrepreneur, yeah. you're making money even when you're not doing work. Oh, awesome. And so that's what I've learned about how to expand. And I've worked a little bit in Dallas now too. Um, I was just out there doing flowers in Austin for South by Southwest, but same thing. Like you have to find good people and that's very hard. And when you find good people, you have to treat them well and you have to pay them well. And like, 
not micromanage. Right. And just to have trust because I feel like I have so much trust in the people that have worked for me that they don't want to let me down. So now your business, what is your business gross now? I mean, well into the six figures, like. Multi six figures. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And I'm actually launching another company, like pretty much completely different. Uh, It's called Flower Therapy Night. It's kind of like do you know paint night where you go to a yes, bar? Okay, yes. it's that, but with flowers. Amazing. I'm really looking forward to that because I've, I've never done anything like that where I'm like, I am building something bigger than myself because right now, like my current business and the book, it really revolves around me, you know? Yeah. And this is something that will just be able to run on its own and make people so happy. And we're using nice. mainly... Uh, American grown flowers, you know, when we can, we're donating all the leftovers to women's shelters. Oh we're my using God, Carly, this is amazing. We're, yeah, wow. we're, we're very excited because. What a labor of love. It is. And Jill, who's my lead designer for Flower LA, she's developing the instructor program. And we're just so excited because we're going to be able to give so many people jobs. And especially freelance florists or even people that maybe they have a the flower business, but they just want some side income or they want th- to teach. And we're going to offer a lot of people in low income areas that might not have opportunities. And we're going to train them for free. And hopefully they'll be able to basically become their own boss. Right. That's amazing. You wrote a book and you started creating content so that you could have more of a reach. So you then got the book out, but you didn't say no to that even when people were telling it wasn't going to happen. And then you, while that was happening, you were creating more and more business around yourself and getting yourself connected with brands. Um, And it's like an unrelenting commitment to what you love. You were unwilling to waver at all from that and from anybody who told you no. It's just amazing how you continue to persevere. And you see that when you love something that much, it definitely does start to communicate with other people because it really is so genuine and it's so true. Like you're so interested in it. Other people start to become interested in it just because you're so excited and you were persistent. And eventually that persistence pays off. Yeah, Um, it, it is true. Like, and I think that a lot of people they won't even ask for something they want. And like people don't, you don't ask for what you want and people don't also don't follow up a lot. Right. And I just think that you have to have perseverance when you get a no and you have to have that persistence. Yeah, totally. You know? So that brings us to this last point, which is you're kind of saying it, but what, what's your advice to people who want to make a living doing what they love? I mean, here you are making, you know, multi six figures, doing flowers, What do you think are the important things that you felt worked that you would say is your advice to somebody who wants to do what they love? I think they need to think about if they want to do the business side of it. That's the first thing I ask people. Like if you love arranging and that's what you love, then you should really, really just be a floor somewhere and you will love it. You will not have to stress. You will get to work eight hours a day doing flowers, you know, and it's really an important question to ask yourself. But if you really want to have that business, then you really need to be prepared for the stress of it all. It's, it can be so stressful dealing with the finances and legal stuff and all of that. But ultimately, it's worth it in the end if you want to have the freedom and have that balance. Yeah. So um, give it a go and don't spend a lot of money testing things out. I think a lot of people will spend a lot of money when it's just not necessary. And I think a key to my success has been that I've been very frugal and try to think about smarter ways that I can get business or like piggybacking off of Mm -hmm. someone else. Because I've had other friends that have tried to start different businesses, whether it's fashion or like a cupcake business. I had a friend and they just spent really a lot of money before they ever tested it out, you know? And so you want to start small and think that you don't have, even if you have that money, don't really spend it so that you can work things out and, and test it and then grow from there. That's great. So what do you want to see happen next? Well, I, you know what I'm working on is the Flower Chef for Kids, which I'm pretty sure I'm going to self-publish that one. Oh, and so a floral design book for kids because kids love doing flowers, boys and girls, and it just is just a, such a fun thing. So 
I'm working on that. And then for Flower Therapy Night, the other company, I'm very, very excited about that. So I'm ready to kind of be dedicated for the next year of, of doing that. And as far as Flower LA, I'm happy with how things are. And I just want to continue to expand, build more events and um, work in as many cities as I can because it's super fun to, <laughs> to get to travel and work. Yeah, so awesome. How can people find you? Oh, they can find me on social media. My Instagram is at the flower chef, just regular flower chef, the flower chef. Uh, that's for Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. Facebook is flower, F-L-O-U-R, floral design. And if anyone has any questions, I always encourage anyone to email me. It's just carly at flowerla.com. Awesome. So awesome. Wow. So cool to hear such an interesting passion and you went for it and stayed in it and you built it. And I think yeah. this is just the beginning. Thank you. Yeah. I, yes. Persistence, persistence, definitely yeah. getting through those tough times oh, yeah. will make it so much more worth it when you get to the other side. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for being on and sharing your story with us. Thank I you loved for hearing having it. Me. It's an honor. I'm like so excited. I listen to every podcast you do. So this is like, oh, it makes me like feel so good. Thank really, you. really amazing for me. I'm just curious. I didn't ask you this. What are your favorite flowers? What type? Oh, my favorite flower is our sweet peas, which I don't, do you know what those are? No. They are delicate they're a spring flower springtime flower they're these delicate thin stems with kind of round petals and they have like a sweet fragrance and they're just they look so beautiful all together like Aww. that I just love those nice and then it just you know it depends on season there's ranunculus and dahlias and every season brings something new but sweet peas I think are my favorite oh I'm gonna have to go check them what are, out what's your favorite flower um, I love the way stargazers smell. Oh. What's the Lily, other word? What lilies it? are very polarizing. I just love. It's a polarizing flower. People love interesting. Her them. I yeah. love the smell. And to look at, I like, I like hydrangeas. I like the blue purplish ones. I have those yeah. at my wedding. So oh, pretty. pretty. They're yeah, so those big. Are, those are big and they last. Some hydrangeas are yeah. pretty tricky. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a flower tip. Because this is the one I get asked. Oh yeah, tell us a flower tip. Um, hy so hydrangeas drink through their petals, so you really need to soak them. Like run it under the faucet, dunk it in a bucket oh, before you put it in a vase, and that will make it last so much longer. Okay, awesome. You're Thank amazing. you, Carly. Thank you. Well, that was fun. I love that every week we're listening to a different person tell their story, and no matter what it is that everybody sets out to do. When they really want it, they find a way to do it. And I love that you just kept saying that you just stuck in it. And I love that last part where you were talking about how like, just ask for it. Like a lot of times people don't even put it out there. Um, all right, so here are some of my takeaways. Number one, don't dive into something just because people say it's what you're supposed to do. Do what makes you happy. Number two, persistence is key. Don't take no for an answer. Number three, find loyal people that you trust to work with you. Treat them well. Number four, running a business has its headaches, but it's worth the freedom. Number five, be mindful of your expenses when you first begin. Be resourceful. Number six, when you've done the work, don't be afraid to stand up for yourself. Fight for what you deserve. You guys, I love you. I love this audience. I love getting to know so many of you. Thank you for writing in. Thank you for telling me what you love to do. I love that when I reached out to Carly, she says, actually, I'm such a fan of your show. So, so thrilling, so awesome. It's one of the greatest rides of my life to have had this experience and to continue to journey with all of you. We have great guests coming up. Um, please let us know who is, who is it that you want to hear from? What kind of person do you want to hear from? You can always email me at hello at don'tkeepyourdayjob.com. Come to the Facebook page. You can follow me at Instagram at kathy.heller, kathy with a C. And I love you guys. Please continue to tell your friends about our show. When you tell your friends about our show, that truly, truly helps us. If each one of you told one friend to listen to the show, we would double our audience. So please, please, I encourage you, if you want to give me a birthday present, my birthday is next Monday. Um, that is a huge birthday present for all of you to tell your friends to listen to the show and I'll be able to see if that happens. So uh, that is my uh, wish that you all continue to know what it is that you have to do in this world and that you continue to put one foot in front of the 
other. And if all of you were happily doing what it is that you love, even if you were just taking one step in front of the other, that would that would give you a sense of growth and, and potential and freedom, and it will give you a sense of what's possible. So I hope that the show continues to inspire you. Please tell at least one of your friends, send them the link to the show, post it on Twitter, post it on Instagram, and tell, tell your friends, say, listen to this show. I love this show. I want you to listen to it. If you guys all did that, we would double our audience, and that would be the best way for you to um, give back to me. Um, I love being able to be this voice to remind everybody of what they have to do in this world. We are all put here for a reason, and we need to get busy figuring out why and contributing that which only we can. I love you all, and I will talk to you next week. I want to give a shout out to the amazing team who makes this show possible. Special thanks to our executive producer, Tim Street, and producer, Emma Kikuchi. The podcast is a production of Authentic. For more info on advertising in this show, visit AuthenticShows.com.